Hi there, it's Dr. Min Lekong, Royal Flying Doctor Service, STAR program, specialised training in aeromedical retrieval. What we're going to do today is talk about uh, the occasional intubator and the issues of emergency airway management for people who, who don't do it that often. So what are we going to do with the occasional intubator talk? We're going to talk about a definition, we're going to talk about key challenges, we're going to talk about RSI. I'll give you some strategies from the literature in my own practice and I'll try to illustrate this with a case. These are the acknowledgements for my presentation. Dr. Weingart Levitan as well as Dr. Brody uh, of the Airway 911 website. The case to illustrate is a 55 year old man with chest pain, he's hypoxic. Uh, confused, hypotensive and um, signs of pulmonary edema on his examination. His ECG shows that. He rips off his mask, he's not tolerating CPAP. What do you do next? Who is an occasional intubator? It's a good question. When I looked at the literature, these are some definitions I got. Does it actually fit you? Are you in this class? I think we're all in this class at some, some point in our medical career. Some of us may stay as an occasional intubator for our whole medical careers. Others will, will transition through this uh, as we become more experienced. In retrieval medicine, um, we have a saying that there is no backup, that you are the backup and therefore you need to be prepared to take on all comers and be uh, resilient in your airway management. Rapid sequence intubation with drugs is one of the highest risk procedures we can do in emergency medicine and critical care and certainly in pre-hospital and retrieval medicine. Why is this? When you break it down, RSI has several steps. When you count that all up, there's seven steps. Each one of those steps, you can make a mistake and each one of those mistakes can potentially be lethal. So I've described at times that RSI actually, when it's taught in the classic manner, can be a really stupid idea. And it's a really stupid idea for people such as the occasional intubator who, who don't get to practice it that often. So when you, when you don't practice something often, it's easy to forget the basics. You can get uh, focused on getting a perfect view. You get an obsession with passing the tube. And, 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 and along with that comes often a failure to confirm position early because you're just happy to try to pass a tube and think that you've got it in the right place. There's a, often a failure to maintain oxygenation during the procedure and a failure most dangerously to give up early and proceed to an alternative technique. This paper by Two and East has published last year um, described the fact that it's difficult to get good research and standardisation because people do things quite differently in terms of their RSI procedure. This study from Melbourne uh, in Victoria and Australia of a paramedic service providing pre-hospital RSI with drugs had some interesting features. The paramedic RSI group had statistically more cardiac arrests. Their protocol was a fairly standard one with fentanyl, midazolam and succinothonium. When you read the details of the study, uh, there was a majority of the arrest patients had been given drugs uh, even though they had no recordable blood pressure and all suffered cardiac arrest. Intriguingly, survival was no different between the hospital and pre-hospital RSI group. The lessons I take were um, that cookbook RSI is a bad thing particularly in the pre-hospital setting in the paramedic service. Uh, be careful about adhering to protocol and beware the hypotensive patient. So I think the occasional intubator should not do classic RSI with a laryngoscope. So the laryngoscope, as you can see this image, is not as intuitive a device as we think. It takes practice and for people who don't use it that often, it, it can actually be used quite uh, dangerously. And, and we think that uh, it's easy to learn how to use it properly, but, but this, this is not something that we should assume. 
uh, our airway strategy for our emergency patients should be simple, easy to do, have a high chance of success um, and maintain oxygenation. Because really during safety for our intubation attempts we should be focusing on the following. To maintain oxygenation at all costs, to minimise airway trauma, to prevent aspiration and then at the very bottom minimise awareness and pain. You would argue that classic RSI does achieve this by doing pre-oxygenation as the first step, but in emergency practice we often get patients not fasted, who have a lot of comorbidities, who normally in elective anaesthesia would be, um, you know, wouldn't be given the anaesthetic, but uh, in emergency practice they need urgent control of the airway and ventilation and we can't assume that the standard pre-oxygenation is going to work. So how would you optimise it? Well, clearly in the patient who is, say, morbidly obese, we would sit them up. Uh, the literature now will suggest that using nasal as well as oral routes of oxygenation is, is beneficial. Scott Weingart's uh, paper on delayed sequence intubation describes a technique using a mask, a positive pressure ventilation with a ventilator to provide oxygenation and the use of ketamine to facilitate this. So it's a, it's a very nice technique. It's been successful that I've used several times now on retrieval medicine. The other strategy from Dr. Darren Brody, who's an emergency physician in, uh, in America, is, is another one that I have used and I would uh, recommend. It's well demonstrated in a video that he's shown here on his website. So please check it out. It's a, it's a nice demonstration. And essentially what they do is they use RSI drugs, so rock uranium and um, atomidate, um, to put down a laryngeal mask airway su supreme device, a second generation supraglottic device with a gastric channel uh, port for draining the stomach. So they put it down, they re the patient, drain the stomach and things are a lot more physiologically uh, better for a, a controlled intubation attempt. So it's a, it's, it's a very clever technique and it's very useful. And, and often um, what I've found in his own experience in, in that he's published is that uh, in a pre-hospital setting you, you, you do this, put the airway down, the patient looks a lot better, their numbers are a lot better. And, and quite frankly just leaving the laryngeal mask airway in for transport and the initial emergency department workup is, is quite satisfactory. So how would you maintain oxygenation in the critically ill? You obviously got to do simple things, a jaw thrust to open up the airway. We know now from uh, the literature uh, that apneic oxygenation is, is a very useful technique. The, the anaesthetic literature has described this for a long period of time, but it's only in the emergency medicine uh, literature and practice that it's starting to be discovered. So what is it? You use a nasal cannula providing 15 litres a minute during laryngoscopy. What does this do? This, this reduces the dead space uh, of, of, um, uh, in the upper airway and improves the oxygen concentration in the upper airway. And oxygen will diffuse down the diffusion gradient into the alveoli. If you have the cook fry of a bougie, you can use uh, that to provide oxygenation during a bougie assisted intubation attempt. Uh, but practically you can just do gentle bag valve mask while you're waiting for the paralysis to work. Should this be done, this should be done with a two-person technique if uh, you're an occasional intubator. So this is a photo from Dr. Levitan's article in uh, EM, uh, EM, uh, emergencyphysicianmonthly.com. Uh, the article is called No DSAT. Check it out. It's a great article. And it shows the nasal oxygenation occurring during laryngoscopy. This was a study published uh, in an elective anaesthetic setting um, looking at obese patients and um, what they showed is that those who got nasal oxygenation during laryngoscopy had a significantly longer safe apnea time as well as a significantly higher minimum saturation during the whole procedure. Induction agents, uh, automidate's really good, we don't have it here in Australia but hopefully we'll get it. Ketamine I would argue is, is a good first line choice for the occasional intubator in a paediatric as well as an adult setting. Um, whether you give it as a rapid bolus um, or titration to a loss of eyelashes, it, it doesn't really matter. The evidence is not uh, clear either way that one's superior. Uh, this study in 97 showed that ketamine and rock uranium versus thiopentone rock uranium, that ketamine 
uh, combination was, was, was better in an obstetric group. And this study out of a Canadian helicopter service showed that ketamine was quite safe and effective in a paramedic service for facilitating intubation. Saxomethonium for decades has been the defining RSI agent and, the, and the, the research shows that the adequate dose for intubation, uh, emergency intubation is one and a half milligram per kilogram. There, there was a study which I'll show you here that suggested that two milligram per kilogram was actually a little bit better and, and I suggest that for the occasional intubator. Um, but we know now that the research is coming out that rock uranium is as good as succinylcholine um, in an emergency department setting for first, first attempt intubation success. However, I think uh, until uh, rock uranium becomes more widely accepted as an emergency RSI drug in Australia, succinylcholine is still king, uh, but its days are numbered. I think the new strategies, as I've described, such as the rapid sequence airway, um, and now with uh, Sugamidex as being a rapid reversal agent for rock uranium uh, becoming available, uh, I think this idea that we give sucks because it's going to wear off and, and um, in an emergency if something goes wrong we can let it wear off. I think with all these new drugs and strategies and, and that issue is no longer going to be relevant. Cricoid pressure is controversial. If the airway is difficult I wouldn't recommend it. But I still do it if I think there's a high aspiration risk, as in these cases um, I've, I've put up here. Uh, this is a nice uh, review in 2005 showing that there isn't a lot of uh, published evidence out there of the efficacy of cricoid pressure. And this pre-hospital paper by Ellis uh, shows that removal of cricoid pressure was beneficial in, in, uh, in a half of cases for improving intubation views. Um, if you're not familiar with the fast track intubating LMA, I think the occasional intubator should definitely become familiar with it. It allows the oxygenation and blind intubation through one device. The published evidence uh, is that it requires a low level of skill and maintenance. Um, it's been successful, almost 100% successful ventilation in a medical student uh, model of research and 85 to 99 percent successful blind intubation rates in uh, a theatre and mannequin study uh, research. Also in an ultrasound model with the cervical spine uh, immobilisation, um, it showed the least cervical spine movement with quickest time to intubation compared to direct laryngoscopy and manual inline stabilisation. And this nice summary here uh, uh, reviewed the literature and basically came to the conclusion it was a useful device both in and outside of the operating room, both for ventilation as well as blind intubation. Um, the occasional intubator should definitely practice using an intubating bougie, certainly before they try it on a real patient. Um, it was the most successful device for cervical spine immobilisation intubations in a pre-hospital retrieval setting in my research, the FDA trial. Um, and the common mistake we see is that um, uh, once the bougie is put into the trachea, the laryngoscope is removed and this is um, a common mistake. It uh, makes passing the, the uh, tracheal tube out of the bougie much more difficult. So once you've got the bougie in but the sats are dropping, um, there are a couple of things you can do. You can rotate the bougie to the side of the mouth and bag valve mask to get the sats back up. If you've got a cook for over bougie, you can attach an adapter and pass oxygen down through the bougie tip. You should confirm uh, tracheal tube placement with capnography, wave, um, waveform capnography. It's unacceptable if you have the equipment and, and it's functioning, you don't do it. And when you don't do it, th th these are the kind of things that can go wrong. Uh, this man lost his airway after being extubated for a dental abscess drainage, multiple intubation attempts um, and an esophageal placement of the tube wasn't detected for some period of time due to lack of use of capnography. Uh, this, this is another man who lost his airway in an intensive care unit in Adelaide and um, the only way that the tracheal tube was checked was with laryngoscopy. Um, and uh, unfortunately uh, an esophageal position wasn't detected for some period of time due to lack of use of capnography. So get back to the case. Uh, this, this man is having uh, an anterior ST elevation MI. He's hypoxic, hypotensive and um, 
got pulmonary edema, how would we modify his, uh, his intervention because he's not tolerating preoxygenation? I think there's a good argument here for doing the rapid sequence airway that Dr. Brody uh, has, um, has promoted. Here we would give some fentanyl and rock uranium, put down an LMA Supreme. In terms of the hypotension, you can address that beforehand with the noradrenaline infusion or a metaraminol a boluses. And, um, and that would be a nice way to do it. The other way that Dr. Scott Weingart uh, uh, has, uh, has written about is the delayed sequence. So in this one, you give some fentanyl and uh, put on the CPAP mask, um, get him to pre-oxygenate on the CPAP mask. And once you're happy with the, the oxygenation, then, then, then um, pushing the uh, paralytic and intubating. Case two is a 24-year-old man who's got a traumatic upper cervical spine injury with core involvement. He's in neurogenic shock and respiratory failure. Classic RSI with uh, thiosux tube is going to be uh, quite dangerous, particularly for the occasional intubator. Um, so a rapid sequence airway here would be, would be very good. So you, you would do this, you would start up some noradrenaline to get the blood pressure back up. You would um, then uh, push some um, ketamine or fentanyl and, and um, or rock uranium as a paralytic and put down the LMA Supreme, drain the stomach, get the oxygen back up and then if everything's okay, you can then um, proceed with intubation or leave the LMA in for transport. So the take home messages are that occasional intubators should not stick to cookbook RSI recipes, that the cornerstone of patient safety is uh, maintenance of oxygenation. Drugs are the least important thing in RSI apart from the most important drug which is oxygen. These are our contact details for the RFDS STAR program. Please email us, give us your comments, let us know if you're enjoying the topics and other topics you might like to enjoy uh, here and hear us um, lecture on. Uh, consider coming to one of our courses and hearing more from us and um, have a good day.